In this uh, era of, uh, of lots of environmental bad news that's whirling around, uh, th th this is a happy story with a happy ending. Uh, <clears throat> just to whet your appetite, I'll mention that there are now 25 times as many bald eagles in the United States as there were in 1970. For the state of Virginia, it's 50 times. So if you're seeing bald eagles all over the place, I'll give you an idea why today. Most birds in North America are declining, uh, but that doesn't include the, some of the ones we'll talk about. All right, uh, we'll uh, talk about the problems that uh, developed with uh, DDT uh, and th some of the mechanisms uh, whereby it worked, and we'll talk about uh, what it took to uh, get uh, DDT banned um, <clears throat> and um, uh, what happened uh, after the ban. Um, so um, uh, th there's the formula for DDT. Uh, it was uh, first synthesized in 1874. Uh, fairly simple molecule. 1939, during the beginning of the war, it was found to have insecticidal properties uh, and became very important in World War II uh, for preventing uh, typhus and malaria. Uh, <clears throat> And, um, um, but it wasn't long after, uh, well, then after the war, uh, it, it had a, a wonderful um, a reputation and glamorous rep reputation. So everybody wanted to use this first of the synthetic uh, insecticides for every imaginable pest purpose. So it very rapidly uh, in 19, uh, 46 was spread all over the world and used for every purpose you can think of. Uh, <clears throat> uh, this was the first of the synthetic organic uh, uh, pesticides. Um, <clears throat> uh, and it, but it wasn't long. The, the, it it, be, it, it um, uh, began making problems. Uh, in uh, Peru, uh, um, uh, it was found that it didn't do the insect control uh, jobs that it was uh, uh, expected to do because uh, in, 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 the, in western Peru, which is very dry because of the rain, uh, the rain shadow of the, of the, uh, the Andes, uh, uh, so th these agricultural is ecosystems are irrigated by river systems coming out of the Andes uh, and that's surrounded by a total desert. So when the DDT killed natural enemies of the pest problems. Uh, there was there was no way to uh, uh, re-inoculate uh, uh, the system with with uh, um, uh, uh, new natural enemies, and so this was the first place uh, where uh, DDT failed to do the job it was supposed to do. Uh, anyway, that was by 1949, 1948, and. Princeton campus uh, uh, d spraying for Dutch elm disease uh, uh, killed a lot of birds. Um, but let's let's go on to um, uh, an interesting case with the western grebes uh, in um, uh, California on Clear Lake, which is uh, northeast of San Francisco. Uh, and there, the fishermen uh, were uh, always bothered by the, the so-called Clear Lake gnat. Uh, and the gnat has a larval phase in, in the water, so they uh, decided they would add DDD, the close metabolite, a little bit less toxic of uh, DDT, uh, add that to the water. So they added 14 parts per billion to the, uh, uh, of DDD to, to the water, and it worked wonderfully, and the fishermen were happy. Uh, and um, so the next year they added 20, uh, and the year after that, another 20. Um, uh, and by that time, uh, on the third uh, edition, it wasn't working quite as well, probably developing some resistance. In any event, um, uh, there were a thousand pairs of, of, uh, of Western grebes uh, in, the, in 1950. 
Uh, and by 1959, they had all but disappeared and gone down to 15. Uh, so uh, somebody had the bright idea to analyze uh, uh, some of these birds, and they found uh, that the fatty tissues had 35,000 times as much DDD, which was, uh, uh, as, as was originally added to the, to the lake. So somehow, uh, the DDT had piled up uh, uh, accumulated uh, by a huge factor in the uh, in the grebes. Uh, well, what's happening here? Um, this was the first case of what is now well known uh, biological concentration. It's easy to picture. If if you have a a, a, a lipid soluble uh, material that's soluble in tissues, li living tissues, uh, and is in, essentially in, insoluble in water, then it's going to partition into the into organisms from water, into plankton or fish or what whatever it is. Uh, if you picture a large fish eating many smaller fish, he um, metabolizes the smaller fish, excretes the metabolic remains, and keeps the DDT. So he keeps keeps uh, uh, eating many small fish, keeping the DDT, and excreting uh, their remains. Uh, and so it piles up uh, in, in w that one step in the food chain. Uh, if you have multiple food chains, like here you've probably got uh, phytoplankton to zooplankton to small fish, maybe slightly larger fish, and grebes can eat a pretty big fish. Uh, so maybe it's four steps in the in the f food chain, maybe multiplied by 10 to 100 fold each at each link in the food chain. So it piles up, uh, and uh, here's, here's the western grebe at the top of the food chain uh, with a huge uh, biological concentration effect. Um, uh, from here through most of this story, we're going to be talking about birds at the ends of long food chains, and this is why uh, they are um, uh, in line for trouble. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so uh, so this, this is a, a well-known phenomenon now. Uh, and people, of course, are high in the food chain too. And so we accumulate uh, not just DDT, and we, we probably still have a few residues uh, of, of DDT from the D uh, DDT era. But we have other, other uh, lipid-soluble, stable materials like like the phthalate esters that are in uh, plastics. And uh, people are still trying to figure out whether they're harmful, but we've all got phthalate esters in us. Uh, and a few other materials, PCBs, it's the same kind of a story. Okay, so, so that establishes uh, biological concentration. Uh, in the 1950s, uh, just a, a, a quick reference that sprayed forests in New Brunswick um, uh, showed a lower reproductive uh, success of this uh, 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 woodcock, which looks like a softball, um, <clears throat> uh, than, uh, than unsprayed areas. I won't bother you how they found that out. Um, the osprey story is, uh, is a good bit more sinister. Um, during the uh, um, 19... Uh, 50s especially, and into the 1960s, uh, the um, ospreys declined precipitously in the eastern United States. They eat fish, you know. Uh, and um, uh, looking at, at Connecticut, 200 pairs had dropped uh, to 12 pairs by 1965. Huge declines. Long Island, New Jersey, similar. Uh, uh, precipitous declines. And looking at a few data, um, do we have a pointer here? or That doesn't matter. I can do without. Um, uh, you can see from this that as the, uh, with a, a normal osprey population uh, uh, produces about 2.3 chicks uh, per nest. But in Maryland, it was half that, and there was three parts per million in the eggs. Uh, and in Connecticut, it was half of that, and there was five parts per million in the eggs. So the, the more DDT in the eggs, uh, the fewer production of, of, uh, uh, of chicks. 
that, of course, doesn't prove anything. It's just a bit suggestive that this, it correlates. Um, <clears throat> looking at bald eagles, um, similar story. Uh, declining reproductive success uh, and the declining populations in the lower 48. Not, not true in Alaska because there wasn't any DDT used in, in Alaska. Um, and uh, analyses of uh, eggs uh, uh, or, or dead chicks showed that the DDT and dieldrin uh, were throughout the system. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about dieldrin, but that's another chlorinated hydrocarbon insecticide, uh, uh, more acutely toxic, uh, uh, a strong carcinogen, uh, but that's not a key part of this story. Uh, but uh, both of those chemicals are present throughout the system, and, and it's also true of other, uh, uh, other uh, uh, birds in, in this story. Um, <clears throat> In Europe, the same thing was happening. Here's the European sparrowhawk, which is a close relative of our coopers. Um, <clears throat> and declining population and egg breakage and, uh, and DDE, the metabolite DDE, which rapidly forms from DDT. And I'll show you how that happens in a minute. Um, <clears throat> uh, uh, DDE and dieldrin present in the eggs and the adult fatty tissues and so forth. So the same thing was happening in Europe. That's true of the uh, short-tailed, um, uh, the white-tailed uh, 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 sea eagle uh, and, uh, and the peregrine and others in Europe. So what was happening in North America, and I won't give you all the examples, was also happening in Europe. Um, big declines in the peregrine falcon, and this is another bird at the end of the long food chains. It's the world's fastest animal uh, in a power dive, can go 200 miles per hour. Uh, severe reproductive failure um, in, uh, uh, around the world, but particularly in North America and Europe. Uh, and, and broken eggs. Uh, and, uh, uh, the, the, and in 1965, uh, and, and this is the bird of falconry. If you're a, a falconer, this is the this is the best bird to have. Uh, and uh, falconers around the world were very upset. Uh, Joe Hickey at the University of Wisconsin called a conference of uh, ornithologists and, and falconers in Madison in 1965, and they compared notes as to what was going on around the world. And they were thunderstruck to f find that the peregrine, uh, as, a, as a breeding species east of the Rockies, was extinct. It was gone already. Uh, and there were only a few in eastern North, in, in, in Quebec. Uh, west of the Rockies, they had declined precipitously. There were a few left, uh, uh, but uh, not many. So, so here, we, and the same, same thing had happened in Europe. So they were really pretty shocked. They produced a book. Uh, telling this story, uh, and throughout the system, DDT and dieldrin was uh, present. PCB is also present uh, somewhere in here, and, and they were terribly suspicious that DDT was was the culprit, uh, but they couldn't prove it. It, it. Just because DDT was in the system doesn't mean that it's causing the effect. And the same, and of course, the dieldrin was there, and that was another culprit and PCBs, and other things were happening in the world. They were shooting off uh, atomic, uh, uh, atomic bombs and, uh, and so forth. Um, <clears throat> so, um, uh, and there were other birds involved in this, like the brown pelican, uh, and I won't give any details about that. Um, uh, the Bermuda petrel uh, seemed to be involved, although not much in the way of data to prove it, except that DDT was all through the system and they were suffering reproductive failure. The Bermuda petrel is a very scarce bird that breeds on Bermuda only. Um, <clears throat> interesting story in, uh, in, uh, about how DDT induced homosexuality. Remind me to bring that up later. It'll fit, fit better. Um, and other species were involved. Um, uh, but I won't go into any detail on that. Anyway, uh, big problems with birds at the ends of long food chains. No way to prove uh, what was happening.
or prove what culprit there, w there might have been. Um, <clears throat> uh, I first got uh, bumped into this story uh, almost accidentally. I've always been a birder. Uh, and I had a postdoc at, uh, at Dartmouth uh, in uh, biochemistry, uh, and they were going to spray the trees in uh, Hanover with DDT to control Dutch elm disease. Uh, and um, some people had said, you know, they killed a lot of birds in previous years. Uh, so we passed the petition around. That's what you always do, you know, you sign petitions. And it, it worked there about like it usually works. Uh, the town father said, we follow, the, we follow the label, we're responsible, we do it at night when there's very little wind and so forth, and that's not what killed birds before. Uh, so they went ahead and they sprayed the trees and we conducted a little study. Uh, we compared sprayed areas in uh, Hanover with unsprayed areas in Norwich on the other side of the Connecticut River, which had never sprayed, uh, and we very easily showed that the DDT had killed a lot of birds in, in Hanover, um, uh, and uh, particularly robins, but ground feeders. And uh, one interesting case was, was, was with uh, uh, some warblers, especially the myrtle warbler, uh, uh, which was uh, um, uh, in, in the southeastern states when this was, uh, spraying was done in April. Uh, and uh, arrived about two weeks after spraying and died the day they arrived. So uh, this was pretty impressive. Uh, we didn't see any dead birds the, the, night, the day after spraying. It, it took several weeks for this to develop, and, but then students from Dartmouth started bringing them in and so forth. Uh, uh, along with uh, uh, tremors, which is the typical symptom of DDT poisoning, and then they died. Um, <clears throat> Okay, let's, um, let's look at just a bit at the chemistry. Uh, in the upper left is the DDT molecule. It can go through this the winding sequence down to DDA at the, at the end, which is a non-toxic uh, uh, end product. That's the way out of trouble. That's the detoxification uh, route. Uh, the more often it uh, it simply loses hydrogen chloride to form DDE in the lower, lower left part of the screen there. Um, DDE, it, it, be, it turns out to be the, 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 the key part of this story. So keep your eye on DDE. You'll hear more, more about it. Uh, <clears throat> it's not as, as acutely toxic as, as the EDT, but it does other things. Um, and I guess that's all we need to bother with that. Okay. Um, so, D, uh, well, the, the, the point of this one is that a DDT is, is very stable. It's persistent. Not much happens with time in the environment, except that it turns into DDE with time. Uh, but it sticks around. Uh, it, it's not, it's not going to, if you spray it on a field or wherever you spray it, it's not... Um, uh, it's it's going to be around there f for a long time. Okay, um, uh, but it's not going to. All of it isn't going to stay in the same place. It has a very low vapor pressure, but it isn't zero, so some passes into the air. It has a very low water solubility, but that's not zero, and so some goes uh, uh, downstream uh, with the water. Uh, it co-distills from wet surfaces. Uh, and uh, enters uh, uh, the circulation patterns of the, of the world, uh, both air and water. It comes down in the rain and snow, uh, uh, contaminates uh, organisms of all sorts, especially at the ends of long food chains because it's more soluble in uh, lipid tissues. Uh, so within a few years, uh, it's turning up in the penguins in, in the Antarctic. Uh, and and in uh, uh, polar uh, polar bears and uh, other uh, uh, organisms in the Arctic. So uh, here is a chemical that is uh, went once released, it's uncontrollable, and it gets all over the place, and it contaminates organisms at the ends of long food chains. So it's basically an uncontrollable 
chemical. Once you let it out of the can, all of this begins to happen. And it happens because it's built into the molecule. It's, it's, it's programmed that way. Um, <clears throat> okay, I mentioned a bit about the solubility characteristics. It's a typical uh, 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 nonpolar uh, organic chemical. If you shake it up in a, a separatory funnel with, a, with a, 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 an organic solvent, it's going to uh, partition into the organic material and it's not going to be in the water. Uh, and so that so it's picked up by food chains, concentrates up the food chains, uh, builds up the, the highest concentrations at the top. We've already been there. And then finally, this is not a biologically inactive chemical. Uh, it does a lot of things. Uh, it has acute toxicity. It blocks the sodium channels in nerve uh, in in nerves. Uh, which leads to tremor and death, and that's how it kills insects, and that's how it also killed, kills birds in uh, Dutch elm disease spraying, which we first uh, bumped into uh, in, uh, at Dartmouth. I should mention, uh, we, we, uh, at Dartmouth, we started this little study knowing, knowing absolutely nothing about DDT. We didn't know any of the literature. Uh, what we discovered, that there was a lot of a lot of birds that had been killed had already been dis discovered years earlier in the mid-1950s. Joe Hickey, in fact, at the University of Wisconsin. George Wallace at Michigan State. So th this was, but it was published in Audubon and bird journals and so forth. Uh, and, that, and, and we didn't look in the, in the literature at all. We just backed into this thing uh, so we, we started with empty heads, uh, but we soon learned that we had rediscovered what was already known. Okay, so it, um, it, it kills birds and insects. It's estrogenic, which is an interesting phenomenon. Uh, and uh, I said I'd, I'd mention it. Um, <coughs> the, the, the story in the Great Lakes with the contaminated uh, herring gulls is that um, uh, the the male gulls were feminized by by the, the estrogenic activity uh, of of uh, DDT, uh, and uh, when it came time to go to the breeding ground be, breeding grounds, they just didn't bother. They were not all that interested, uh, and uh, all the females went, uh, and there was a great shortage of males. So the females paired up with each other and laid double clutches of sterile eggs and sat on them all summer and nothing happened. So here's an interesting case of induced homosexuality uh, through the estrogenic activity of DDT and that, that's not really central to this story but it's, 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 a, it's, it's biologically a very active chemical. And then it induces enzymes in the liver. It, uh, the liver breaks down toxic things that come along uh, and um, uh, and it also inhibits enzymes, and that's going to be the heart of this this story. Um, uh, <clears throat> it inhibits an enzyme called a calcium ATPase, which is in the avian oviduct. And we'll talk about that a, a bit more. In the, and it also turns out to be carcinogenic in, uh, in laboratory animals. Uh, uh, DDE is particularly is the the carcinogen uh, in uh, standardized uh, tests with mice. Uh, that's also not going to be central to this part of the story. And um, all right, so, so built into the molecule is a, a stable chemical, travels around the world, partitions into organisms, concentrates in food chains, and when it gets to the top of the food chains, it's a biologically active chemical that can stir things up and make trouble. And so that's what happened. Let's take a look at a, a few more f photos. So on the left is a peregrine egg uh, that's broken. Uh, the, the, uh, it, the, the, the shell is thin, uh, and uh, it breaks before it hatches, and an and, and eggshell supplies calcium to the, to the developing bones of the embryo. So an eggshell gets thinner uh, as the embryo develops inside of it. But it, 
but in this case, it, it starts out too thin uh, and breaks prematurely. On the right is a bald eagle. The chick made it. Uh, and the egg, egg in the lower left uh, is too thin and it broke. Um, now, here comes some data that really is interesting. By this time, uh, in the 19, um, mid uh, 60s, 1967 and so forth, um, a lot of people were thinking about cal calcium metabolism. Some, metabolism. Something was the matter with calcium metabolism uh, and there are various possibilities. Uh, I was one that thought that, that uh, enzyme uh, uh, in, in, uh, induction in the liver was was a part of it, and you can develop a theory of say just how this works, um, and that turns out to be wrong. Um, in any event, everybody's thinking about calcium metabolism, so uh, Derek Radcliffe, an ornithologist in uh, England, uh, went around to museums uh, and measured the thickness of eggshells. Uh, 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 museums, uh, especially in the early part of the 20th century were, co were uh, collecting uh, eggshells uh, and you can blow the contents out through two holes in it and, and he worked out an index where you weigh the shell uh, and measure it and you can calculate uh, the uh, thickness of the eggshell and, uh, and the upper one is for peregrines in the uh, UK uh, and you can see going back to almost to 1900 uh, the thickness of the eggshells in the British peregrines uh, were more or less constant with the usual scatter. And suddenly in 1947, they all became thinner by an average of 18%. So here suddenly is a thinning of peregrine eggshells in 1947. Uh, Sparrowhawk data, uh, the lower chart shows a similar thing. There are not as many eggs, to, but uh, a, a drop of about 16% thinner after 1947. So what's going on here? Well, a lot of things happened in 1947. I already told you that in, in 46 was the big influx of DDT into the world system, uh, but a lot of things happened. And there's PCBs out there, and there's Dieldrin, and there are atomic uh, bombs going off, uh, and who knows what else? And of course, uh, the arguments were made that it was not DDT. But this makes, made everybody extremely suspicious uh, of DDT. I was one of them. Uh, but there were lots of people that figured DDT is doing this. But there wasn't, this doesn't prove it. This shows coincidence, uh, uh, but it doesn't prove it. Uh, Joe Hickey was in touch with Derek Rock, Radcliffe in Britain, uh, and so he sent his uh, graduate student, Dan Anderson, who's now at the University of California at uh, uh, um, Irvine, um, sent him around to measure eggshells in North America, and he got eggshell thinning also beginning in 1947 in North America. So whatever happened in Europe was happening here as well. And that was true of uh, bald eagles that he measured. Uh, he also measured some other, uh, 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 measured uh, uh, peregrines. Uh, so again, we're, we're stuck with an amazing coincidence, but uh, no, no proof. Uh, but the Fish and Wildlife Service was paying attention to all of this. Uh, and um, uh, at the Patuxen Wildlife Research Center in Laurel, Maryland, uh, which is not far from here, um, they decided they had to do controlled experiments. Well, you can't put, um, uh, first of all, you, the, the obvious bird, uh, a target bird is a peregrine, but they were, they were gone. So you, that doesn't make a good laboratory uh, 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 process. So they decided to use kestrels. Kestrels are in the same genus as the uh, uh, genus Falco, uh, as the peregrines. <coughs> And, um, uh, but you can't just put a couple of uh, a male and a female uh, kestrel into a cage and expect them to lay eggs and raise chicks. It doesn't work that way. Um, it turns out they, they like lots of privacy and lots of space. 
they like a cage about the size of this room. Well, not many labs are in a good position to run a controlled experiment with cages like this, uh, and it would need to be outside and so forth. But they did it at uh, Laurel, Maryland, uh, and they, um, uh, they fed, uh, and, and each pair was either given uh, a clean food as controls or a food contaminated with both DDT and dieldrin um, <clears throat> uh, as was present at the concentrations that were present in food in nature. Why both DDT and dieldrin? Because they didn't have enough kestrels to get statistical significance if they separated those two variables. They couldn't do a, a DDT separately and dieldrin separately. They actually used DDE because that's what's in the environment. Okay. Um, and, with, and the first generation, right away, they got a, a 16 or 17 percent shell thinning. So that proved it. There's no question. Either DDT or dieldrin or both are causing thin shelled eggs. Uh, so that really pinned the tail on the donkey and eliminated the, uh, the um, uh, confusion and, uh, and the ability to, to say, well, it's really PCBs and so forth. And they, uh, they then found that mallard ducks uh, uh, behave similarly, uh, and they were able to use them, uh, which are a lot easier to work with than kestrels, and they don't need such a, fa a big fancy cage and so forth. And they showed uh, that DDE causes thin-shelled eggs, dieldrin does not, PCBs do not, nothing else does. Only D the metabolite the DDE causes thin-shelled uh, eggs, uh, and that's what's behind the problem. So they finished uh, pinning the tail on the donkey, uh, and that really proved the cause and effect relationship. Question, what does gallinaceous mean? Uh, uh, gallinaceous uh, are um, uh, chickens, pheasants, quail, uh, and, and, and I, that's there because in the in the hearings that developed, in, in, that I'll talk a bit about, um, some, uh, a fair amount of studies were done in the 1950s. And this is in Silent Spring, she mentioned this too, um, where um, they used pheasants and quail and they're easy to work with, they make, and chickens, and they make, uh, that makes an easy experiment. And they were able to feed these birds huge amounts of DDT and they kept right on laying eggs and reproducing and uh, everything was hunky-dory. Uh, <clears throat> and um, they even got it to, uh, with I think pheasants, they, they were, got it up to 1% of the bird. There was so much DDT in them and they kept right on reproducing. They are, uh, gallinaceous birds are totally different from birds of prey. Their metabolism, everything is different. And so they were the wrong birds, but that came, that came out in the, in the hearings. They kept telling us about the pheasants and the quail and so forth. It didn't fly, but they sure tried. That's why I put it there. All right, how does a bird lay an egg? What's going on here? Um, here's the avian oviduct. Um, a sperm comes in the bottom. It has to find its way up, uh, all the way up the oviduct uh, to the ovary up there, and that's where there are a lot of uh, unfertilized eggs. Uh, uh, the egg gets fertilized, and it then begins to work its way down the oviduct, uh, and, and it gets uh, yolk and all the good stuff that it takes to, that it belongs in an egg, and it finally gets down to this last one, uh, and it doesn't have a shell. It's got to have a shell. Um, uh, where is it going to get, uh, get there's, there's no calcium in there. Where is it going to get the shell, um, uh, the calcium to, to make a shell? Turns out now, picture a robin or any bird. A robin will lay an egg on day one, and a second egg on day two, and a third on day three, and a fourth on day four, and starts to incubate on day four because they want them all to hatch at once. It would be very tricky if some are, have hatched uh, 
uh, and others are, need to be incubated and you wouldn't be able to feed the chick well and, and anyway so they synchronize it by starting to incubate them after the whole clutch is laid. But she doesn't accumulate uh, from, the, from her daily diet enough calcium to go around and make all these eggs at once. Um, turns out that this is hormonally controlled. Uh, the uh, the uh, uh, ovaries secrete estrogen. Uh, estrogen causes the, the uh, bird to um, accumulate uh, in advance of egg laying uh, calcium uh, from the diet and deposit it in the hollow parts of the skeleton. And the birds, you know, have hollow skeletons. That makes them light, um, especially in the femur. So they accumulate a good supply of, uh, of uh, um, calcium in the, in, in the hollow parts of the skeleton. And then just before laying eggs, this is mobilized, goes through the bloodstream, comes down to just outside of the oviduct, uh, and there the enzyme calcium ATPase takes the calcium by the hand, takes it across the membrane to the inside of the, uh, uh, of the oviduct where it becomes the eggshell. Uh, and we don't need to get into the chemistry of what all goes on making it into calcium carbonate for the eggshell. But anyway, calcium, um, uh, uh, um, calcium ATPase is the enzyme that takes it across that membrane to get it from the bloodstream uh, to the interior of the oviduct. Calcium ATPase is specifically inhibited by uh, DDE. Uh, it's, uh, it varies from one species to another. Uh, so the calcium ATP, ATPase in uh, uh, pheasants and quail and chickens uh, is uh, insensitive to uh, to DDE, uh, but the birds of prey are highly sensitive to it. Uh, even there, s some uh, are more sensitive than others. Uh, but certainly the peregrine and the osprey and so forth are extremely sensitive. So DDE is, is blocking the transmission of calcium from getting through the uh, walls of the oviduct to the inside where it forms the egg cell. So that's how it works. That's where the thin-shelled eggs come from. Uh, and this happens particularly with birds at the ends of long food chains. So that's the way it works. Okay. Uh, by 1966, um, a lot of people were very uptight about this whole DDT situation and wanted to see it banned because it was just doing a lot of damage to wildlife. Um, I mentioned that I bumped into it in, at uh, Dartmouth College. I didn't know anything about it then. Uh, I moved to Stony Brook in 1965 and there uh, was a, an, another group of people that um, wanted, to, um, uh, <coughs> uh, uh, wanted to stop the use of, of a DDT in the marshes uh, to supposedly to control mos mosquitoes um, <clears throat> and uh, that was being done by the Suffolk County Mosquito Control Commission and meanwhile some of these people especially a guy named uh, Dennis Puelston uh, had done a lot of studies on uh, ospreys uh, and showed their dramatic uh, uh, reproductive failure uh, <clears throat> Uh, 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 particularly on uh, Gardner's Island of uh, on Eastern Long Island, uh, and uh, the, the the so the the effort became to stop the Suffolk County Mosquito Con Control Commission from using DDT. Well, they were not about to do that. Uh, they laughed us off. Um, <coughs> uh, the uh, commissioner of uh, of the Mosquito Commission would talk to a group and he'd say it's perfectly harmless and he uh, ate a pinch of DDT and that sort of disarmed the audience uh, <clears throat> and um, so he paid no attention and we wrote letters to editors and letters to congressmen and so forth and uh, no no dice um, and then a, a lawyer came into our midst and he said well if you scientists we were all scientists of one kind or another um, if you guys know what you're talking about, maybe a lawsuit would make a difference. Uh, well, that sounded like fun. 
Uh, and so we gathered our reprints together, uh, and um, and he showed us how to how to write affidavits, and and so we put all this stuff together. And in about two weeks, um, he marched off with all these papers to the Supreme Court in Riverhead, Eastern Long Island. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and, uh, and and we sued the Suffolk County Mosquito Con uh, Control Commission. Two weeks later comes a temporary injunction stopping them in their tracks. Uh, and this really electrified us. This is great stuff, what this lawyer's got. Uh, and, um, um, and that stopped the, the commission. And there's a funny little story to that. The, the, um, the day after the injunction was issued, uh, one of the trucks of the Mosquito Commission came down one of the streets in Patchogue uh, and was spraying DDT in everybody's yard and so forth. It turns out that they'd chosen the wrong street because that was where the lawyer lived. And they sprayed his, his, his yard and he ran out with a paper towel and soaked up this stuff and came running up to Stony Brook and I, I was running analyses in those days and there was DDT and he rushed off to, to Riverhead and charged contempt of court and so forth. So this gave the Mosquito Commission another black eye, which was what we were trying to do. Um, <clears throat> so um, uh, we did a good bit of thinking about this, that, that this approach of taking environmental problems to court was seemed like a good idea. We had gotten action in, in, in a couple of weeks, and here people have been writing their letters and congressmen and whatnot for 10 years, and nothing made any difference. And here we had gotten action immediately. And you, you only have to con convince a judge, or at least so it appeared to us. Um, and so after writing memos to each other and so forth, and, in uh, October of 1967, that's now 50 years ago, um, we founded a, a new organization called the Environmental Defense Fund, and there were 10 of us, uh, and um, uh, we had these papers, which is a certificate of incorporation. I don't think anybody ever read it, but uh, anyway, we signed this thing and created uh, what shortly became known as EDF. Um, and, um, and we didn't have any money. There was no organization. It was just this paper and ten of us sitting around the room. Uh, and then um, the topic um, came up that uh, 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 incorporating this document in Albany was going to cost $37. And there were no volunteers. Where is that going to come from? Well you know, from the, from the treasury of the organization. Well, there wasn't any. Uh, and, and there was no treasurer and so forth. <clears throat> and finally, uh, Lou ba uh, um, uh, Bob Bermanac from Connecticut said, I think I, had, I know a sugar daddy up there, and he'll pay the $37. And we immediately elected him treasurer. Uh, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> and so it, it was incorporated. Uh, and then a second thing happened at that same meeting. Uh, one of the trustees was Lou Batts, who was a, a, a professor of biology at Kalamazoo College in Western Michigan. And he said, um, uh, if you guys come out and try to stop this proposed Dieldren application in Western Michigan, um, I can guarantee it guarantee to cover expenses for $10,000. Well, that sounded pretty exciting uh, <clears throat> um, to an organization that was only 20 minutes old and had no nothing of any kind. Um, so we thought, let's do it. Um, uh, there was a problem and that it was Dieldren. Uh, but we soon learned that they were also using DDT on the elm trees in western Michigan and we already knew that game. So we rolled the two chemicals together and, and uh, filed suit in, uh, in Grand Rapids against both DDT and Dieldren. Uh, and we had all this, lots of uh, uh, reprints. We were beginning to get to know this game uh, by that time. This was, this was in November 
1967. It was only two weeks after this incorporation process. Um, and sure enough, within in a short time, we had an injunction against the Michigan Department of Agriculture. Um, <clears throat> and we had sued the state of Michigan, and this was pretty heady stuff. This was great fun. Um, and, um, and then we had a hearing uh, a few days later, and several of us testified, and we told some of these stories and put our reprints into, into evidence and so forth. Um, and um, uh, then uh, the uh, injunction was dissolved and we were thrown out of court. Uh, we began to see that we had a problem. Um, we did not have standing to sue. Uh, you, anybody can't just walk into a court and sue, uh, especially on behalf of somebody else or something else, uh, unless you have legitimacy to do that, and that's called standing. Um, and here we were, in effect, representing birds, uh, and we, we just didn't have any reason to be in that court. That we, were, we didn't have any standing. So we got dismissed. We got, were tossed out, um, and they dissolved the, uh, the uh, injunction. Um, and so the, the Michigan Department of Agriculture was free to go ahead with their Dieldrin application. And um, just then it started to snow in western Michigan. Uh, and it was late November, and that did it. The, the, they couldn't spray the Dieldrin. Uh, in fact, it put it off for a whole year. Well, we didn't know what was going to happen. All we knew was that we were thrown out of court, but that, we, but that the snow had bailed us out. We think, you know, we, this is working very nicely. You can win by winning, but you can also win while you're losing. Uh, and we got the feeling that we had some help in high places anyway. Um, <clears throat> so, um, uh, and just about then, I think we were still in, in Michigan, comes a phone call from somebody named uh, 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 Laureato in Milwaukee. Wisconsin, and she said they're going to use uh, DDT on elm trees in, Mich in, in uh, Milwaukee, and how about if you guys come over here uh, across the lake, uh, Lake Michigan, and uh, stop them from spraying DDT on elm trees in Milwaukee. Um, well, again, it sounded like a good thing to do, so we did just that. But we quickly realized that we were about to get tossed out of that court for the same standing reason. Um, but the hearing examiner seemed to be on our side. At least, at least he said there is a law in Wisconsin, uh, a water pollution law, that says that if you can prove that something is a, dis a, a disruptive or destructive uh, uh, material in water, uh, then it can be banned from the state. If you prove that it's a, a pollutant of the waters of the state of Wisconsin. Um, but, uh, and, and that uh, if residents of Wisconsin petitioned, uh, then there would be a hearing. And this would be a hearing before a hearing examiner, not before a court, so there was no standing issue involved. And here we would, uh, we would have Excuse me. We would have a uh, have a full blown hearing with no dismissal uh, from court uh, to worry about. Uh, so uh, the petition was filed. We got the hearing uh, and proceeded to have a have the hearing that uh, dragged on for about uh, six, six months. Um, and we got witnesses from all over the place and a lot of people that uh, were. Had, had been doing a lot of research and they were very eager uh, to testify because they they wanted to see something done about this about this problem um, uh, so we had no trouble getting witnesses and we got some excellent witnesses we got witnesses on insect control from southern california and from uh, 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 canada from um, 
Tor Torado. Uh, we um, had excellent um, uh, ornithologists from all around the country. Uh, uh, the, we uh, got a, a toxicologist uh, from uh, Stockholm um, who had been chairman of a commission in Europe that had done some DDT banning in Europe. So, uh, and, and to show you how this <coughs> how eager people were to be involved with this, uh, I was given the job of calling this guy named Geron Lofroth in Stockholm. And I had never heard of him and he had never heard of me. And I called him up and I told him what we were doing. And he seemed to already know a bit about that. Um, and I said, we can't uh, pay anything except your plane fare. Um, uh, you'd think that people would turn down something like that. And two days later, he was in Madison. He dropped whatever it was he was doing and came there uh, and made a difference. Anyway, so we had this um, uh, hearing in Michigan uh, and uh, in Wisconsin. Uh, and um, uh, uh, it, the conclusion of that was that it, DDT was a, a pollutant of the waters of the state and it was banned in Wisconsin. That was the end of that. So we had it banned in Wisconsin and then to our astonishment, um, back on Long Island, uh, where we had a year earlier had gotten DDT banned, we were thrown out of that court. Same reason, no standing and so forth. Um, <clears throat> the, the, the judge had, had maintained the temporary injunction until he, got, he convinced the legislature that they should ban it. And the legislature then banned DDT and then he threw us out of court for the standing problem. Uh, so so we, had, we had gotten people on our side who were helping uh, and, and we were winning even as we were thrown out of court. And meanwhile, and, and, and then it was spread to Albany and DDT was banned in New York State. And meanwhile, uh, it also was banned with a similar process in Michigan. So, so here we had been losing all along thrown out of court uh, in, in both places. Um, and, uh, but we had gotten bans on DDT in three, three big states. Um, so that sort of went to our heads and we figured, well, we better see what's going on in Washington. It's time uh, to, um, to uh, file suit in Washington. Um, and, um, and that was hard to do because we, we didn't see how we had the capacity to do that, do something like that. Um, and um, uh, the, the trustees of EDF were scattered all over doing other things and nothing was happening. And we had one in Wisconsin, uh, but uh, nothing, it was, nothing was moving. Uh, and I uh, was told by um, um, <coughs> um, Joe Sachs, the the then um, honcho of environmental law, that I should call um, Jim Mormon at the Center for Law and Social Policy in Washington, a new public interest law firm, um, and, and maybe they could help. So I called him up and I said, we've, we've got to sue the U.S. Department of Agriculture and so forth. And he said, well, if, if we're going to do that, you're going to have to come down here and help write it. Well, <clears throat> that didn't fit plans at all, but in a couple of days I was in Washington. Uh, and um, th by this time we knew this game pretty well, and it wasn't at all hard to write up the scientific parts of, of the petition. Uh, he did all the legal, and uh, they did wonderful legal work uh, in this new organization. And... Um, uh, so we filed a, a petition with the U.S. Department of Agriculture, uh, also with the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare because of the carcinogenesis story, which I won't get into. Um, <clears throat> and um, the agencies paid no attention. They didn't even send a postcard telling us that, we, that they had received it. So we went to, went to the Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit and said these people have ignored us and... We, they should pay attention. And, and the, so the court didn't throw us out for the standing thing. They went back to the agency and said, 
you guys are going to have to pay attention. And so they did, and they came through with a, uh, with a, um, a denial. They simply said no. We went back to the court and said, the, this is uh, arbitrary and capricious. Uh, they didn't give any reasons. Um, and the court again didn't throw us out. They went back to the agency, uh, which, was in the, which was making motions to dismiss us, throw these guys out. Um, <clears throat> and um, for, the, for the, uh, the, the third time, they went back to the agency and said, you're going to have to give real reasons. Uh, and, um, and you'll have to make a decision. Uh, and it went back and forth three times. You're going to have to make a decision uh, on the merits of, of this case. Uh, so we had survived in the Court of Appeals uh, and not been thrown out. And the judge named Basilon had written that, uh, that we did indeed have standing, that this was a legitimate issue. Uh, and that we uh, were re representing the public interest and in, in, in concern for wildlife and so forth. So we had survived the this, this standing barrier in the Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. That turns out to be the, the beginning of environmental law. Uh, and now uh, everybody's do, uh, environmental organizations are filing lawsuits all the time, uh, but that was the, f the initial a case that won the, the standing battle, uh, standing issue, the DDT story. Anyway, um, uh, so indeed there was a, a, a hearing, uh, but um, uh, oh, and just at that moment, um, uh, the, 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 the court order came down to the Department of Agriculture to hold this hearing, and just at that moment, <clears throat> uh, pesticide regulation was transferred to the new agency called uh, the Environmental Protection Agency. So suddenly the new agency, uh, EPA, uh, had ju jurisdiction over uh, pesticides and the court order came down. They had, a, they had to make a decision on the merits and they didn't have a clue how they were going to do that. Uh, and further, USDA had never canceled uh, or, or banned a chemical um, in, in its history. They, they, they only approved them. Um, <clears throat> so they, the, there was no precedent for how you do it, and we were determined to have judicial rules of evidence. We did not want uh, a, a, a pesticide salesmen and, and lobbyists and so forth coming in and saying DDT is absolutely safe and walking away. We wanted witnesses to be qualified, to have, they've worked with on DDT in one way or another, uh, and we're gonna have cross-examination. So if they make a statement, uh, 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 then we're gonna be able to cross-examine. And it took, it was six months of arguing. The industry didn't wanna have any part of that. Uh, a, lot of the, a lot of hearings, you know, that pe people come in and they, they read a statement and they put a, document into the record and they walk out. And so it, it becomes a kind of a popularity contest instead of uh, getting to the heart of, of, of an issue. Well, we won that. We got, we got judicial rules of evidence. Uh, the hearing finally began. By this time, uh, William Ruckel's house had been appointed uh, to be the new administrator of, e of EPA. Uh, and this court order came down about two weeks after he was appointed to be administrator and he didn't have a, know how this was going to run either. Uh, <clears throat> but, but that court order came down almost before he had found his telephone. Anyway, so uh, we went through the whole business much like we did uh, in uh, Wisconsin. Um, brought in witnesses from all over the place, that dragged on for a year. At the end of the year, um, Ruckel's house banned DDT. That was the end of it. Uh, it's never come back. That was, it was banned in the US with the, uh, with the um, condition that it could be used for any public health uh, emergencies, which have not, not happened. Uh, so 
that was it in 1972. It was in June of 1972 that DDT was banned, and that's how it got that way. All right, um, we had had set lots of of um, of legal and environmental uh, and scientific precedents. So we turned right around and uh, went through the same process with Dieldrin. Dieldrin wasn't causing thin-shelled eggs, but it was causing plenty of problems, uh, not just with, with birds and killing birds outright, uh, but, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, but with fish and so forth. So Dieldrin was a very bad actor, and it was also a powerful carcinogen. So we, we went through the whole business with Dieldrin. That's a picture of a pile of dead birds from a from a, a spraying in the 1950s in, in Michigan. Somebody had gathered up all the dead birds and so forth. Um, and in, um, so there was a long hearing, a different hearing examiner, a better one than the DDT guy, <coughs> who turned out to be, a, he was really pretty bad. And if you end up looking at my book, you'll, you'll see some interesting stories about um, uh, about the hearing examiner in the in the DDT story, he he was really bad news, but we won a, won the game anyway. Uh, Russell Train banned uh, Dieldrin in 1974, um, and and Aldrin. Aldrin turns into Dieldrin when you when you spray it. Both of them were insecticides, uh, but uh, Dieldrin is a stable chemical. Aldrin turns into Dieldrin, so the issue is really Dieldrin. Okay. Um, all right. So what happened? Um, so DDT was banned in the U.S. and it spilled around the world that way, and was uh, you know, the usage was greatly cur curtailed elsewhere. Um, and uh, but um, uh, uh, fast forward now for uh, forty years. Um, <coughs> All of us went on to do other things um, because we had taken care of, of, uh, of the DDT matter. Um, and, um, but let's, what, let's now come up to almost the present day and see what happens. The Peregrine Falcon, uh, in the 1940s in North America, there were uh, 2,500 to 3,000 uh, pairs. Uh, <clears throat> and these are estimates coming from the Peregrine Fund uh, in uh, Boise, Idaho. Uh, dropped down to near close to 300 pairs, 90% decline, um, uh, in, by 1970. And now it's back to about 3,000 pairs. It's probably more than that because, because the um, uh, Peregrines have decided that the, a city dwelling is not such a bad idea. There's an endless supply of food in the form of pigeons. They're easy to catch. Um, uh, the, uh, they're cliff nesters in, in nature, and buildings look a lot like cliffs, and they have cornices and nice places. Uh, and so, uh, and the pe people the, uh, don't, don't seem to be dangerous. Um, and so lots of them have moved into the cities, and that's true of all the cities in the United States now. They all have peregrines feeding on pigeons, uh, <clears throat> and they nest on, uh, on bridges. Uh, <clears throat> uh, th this has, has not always worked out because sometimes they fall off the bridge into the river, uh, the chicks, I mean, uh, or they fall down in the city streets and run into the problems there. Uh, but anyway, it, it has been nevertheless very successful um, and um, the the peregrine fund uh, um, established in 1970 uh, began breeding uh, peregrines uh, and that was very difficult to learn how to how to breed them and they did uh, over the course of about 30 years they uh, they produced uh, I think somewhere in the neighborhood of 5,000 peregrines uh, and they uh, learned how to release them in the environment, uh, and they took hold. Uh, and they re reintroduced them into the eastern United States where there weren't any left. Uh, so they had to use the Alaskan uh, subspecies uh, to produce the ones to, to 
put back into the eastern U.S. Uh, so we have the Alaskan subspecies as the peregrine in eastern, U eastern North America now. Um, <coughs> so the peregrines are back in a big way. Uh, bald eagle, another amazing story. Um, <coughs> they had gone down to a, a four to five hundred pairs in 1963 in the, in the lower 48. They were unaffected in Alaska. Um, uh, uh, now there are probably in the neighborhood of 13,000 pairs. That's a 25% uh, increase since 1970. Huge increases uh, in bald eagles. Um, about uh, uh, nationally about 25 times, but this study was done by the Center for, uh, for uh, Biological Conservation, or for Conservation Biology at the College of William and Mary in Virginia. 50 times as many in the state of Virginia as there were in 1970, bald eagles. Amazing comeback. That's not 50%, 50 times as many bald eagles. Um, the uh, uh, Connecticut Audubon, <laughs> excuse me, <clears throat> Connecticut Audubon uh, did very careful uh, population studies uh, over the same time frame, uh, and there were 31 times as many ospreys in Connecticut as there were in 1970, uh, and uh, that would be there would be similar data like that from Long Island. I haven't seen them, but they probably exist. Uh, and, and all over the United States, especially New Jersey, for example. So a huge comeback uh, with the uh, ospreys again. And both of these, uh, the bald eagle and the, uh, they were on the endangered species list. They were removed uh, from the endangered species list. Uh, brown pelican, which disappeared from much of the West Coast. Uh, they're back in a big, big way. Uh, Cooper's hawk. Big increases in Cooper's hawks uh, and so forth. So the birds are back in a huge, uh, in a huge, spectacular way as, as a result of the. Uh, that's a nice picture of an osprey. And um, all right. So what did all this accomplish? I see I'm running a bit over time. We'll be we'll be done in a spec. Um, <clears throat> First of all, um, uh, the, uh, the DDT thing and the precedents led to the banning of aldrin and dieldrin, and then, then chlordane and heptachlor, and then uh, uh, myrex. Uh, and um, uh, so, the, so within the US through the 1970s, there were six chemicals, uh, all of them bad actors that were banned in, nine, in 2001 the uh, so-called POPS treaty, the pers Persistent Organic Pesticides Treaty in Stockholm. Uh, this was a, a, a convention involving 180 countries. Uh, they banned the six that the United States had banned uh, in um, uh, it's 23 years earlier. Uh, they banned it nationally and added a half a dozen more, and in 2013, uh, they added a dozen to that. So f feeding on the DDT ban, there now have been uh, two dozen uh, 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 mostly carcinogenic chemicals banned internationally, uh, not the direct result of the DDT thing, but that was the one that started the dominoes to fall uh, and involved the precedent. Um, <coughs> um, there's a, another cancer story I could tell, but I won't. Um, 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 but um, it, it improved, uh, it, it showed that getting carcinogens out of our environment uh, led to less cancer. Anyway, we'll skip that. Um, the legal precedents I already talked about would be form, form, forming the basis for environmental law. The recovery of the birds, uh, um, I um, already covered, uh, and I, I haven't said much about EDF. But EDF uh, was the was the plaintiff through all these these cases, 
uh, and called the witnesses and for that matter paid the bills. Uh, and now EDF is a big uh, uh, organization active in 20 countries. Uh, EDF uh, is mainly responsible for, uh, for China having uh, um, initiated a, a cap and trade uh, uh, system for carbon dioxide emissions. Uh, EDF brought it within one vote of passing in the United States, and this was about 2010. Uh, and uh, but it, but it failed, and now of course we're we're in reverse on the on the whole thing. Uh, but um, and EDF has about 525 employees now. So EDF from the original 10 uh, with nothing uh, has turned into a, a big, very effective uh, organization. And with that, I'm going to quit and take uh, any questions you might have. <laughs> yeah. What lessons did you learn about trying to convince skeptical people on science while doing this? Is it, I mean, is it, did you find it possible to convince? Um, you can convince impartial people. If, if a person, there's some kind of a slogan, I'll, I'll Try to repeat it. If a person's income depends on a certain product, they're going to defend that product, and you're going to—it's going to be next to impossible to talk them out of it. You're—you're uh, you're going to have to find neutral people. Conflict of interest plays a huge role in the general sense. We convinced judges, hearing examiners. Uh, and we had a masses of scientists played a role in this. This wasn't a f few people. This was a lot of people. And they had influence. I don't think they have any influence anymore, but uh, that's a different, different story. Yeah. Uh, several years ago, I was listening, just scanning the radio, I was listening to a talk show, and they had somebody on who agreed that DDT should be banned for outdoor use, but they thought in Africa, where malaria was a real problem, there was a role for DDT for indoor use only. The program didn't have anybody on as an opposing view, and I was just kind of curious what you thought of that. Uh, more than thought of that, that, and that's a good question. Um, in the beginning, uh, Dieldrin was extremely effective for, for malaria and typhus, and during the war, and, and after the war. <clears throat> but very quickly, um, DDT develop resistance uh, and, and often cross resistance to other chemicals too. So you develop re resistance to A and you try B that's never been used before and they're already resistant to that. So very clever. Anyway, um, uh, there, but there are places in Africa where it's still effective and it's effective uh, with indoor spraying. Uh, and they spray the walls and the mosquitoes come in and they sit on the wall be and they're night night biters so they sit on the wall and um, sometimes it, they don't like that and it drives them out of the building um, in any event it's very effective for that and it still is and it's a, it's it's a, um, uh, it's recommended by the world health organization in those places where there isn't resistance and there are not that many places, but it's still used. It's very effective. It's, that's a, a small quantity, uh, has no environmental uh, effect, uh, no I impact. So that's just fine. The, the difficulty is that if, if, if it's being used for that purpose, in s picture some village off somewhere, they then decide, well, maybe we'll use it for some other purposes such as in agriculture. Um, then there's a lot of DDT around and that develops resistance. So the, the small u indoor use works because it's small uh, and it's no problem and that's a good idea. Uh, uh, but um, wherever the usage is large scale, uh, it defeats itself. Yeah. How did the, um, the woman who wrote the, the Silent Spring. Rachel Carson. Yeah. How did the interest in her writing and her work 
intersect with or did it come after or before? Or how did it inter <coughs> interact with what you were doing? Uh, Silent Spring, uh, published in 1962, I think it was, um, was an excellent literature review of the scientific literature accumulated in the 1950s and up to about 1960. Um, uh, and it's an excellent description of that literature. Um, it did not change policy, uh, except it educated a lot of people. So it, it, it probably made the ground more fertile for what began to happen in the late 1960s. Uh, but there, there was a gap of, of about six years in there between the book and the litigation that ultimately led to the banning in 1972. So the ban in 72 that came from litigation starting in 66, 67, was well after Silent Spring. So Silent Spring certainly led to a, a lot of uh, a, a favorable public opinion, um, but it, it didn't lead to any action. How come they thought the elm tree would be saved by DDT? Well, that's another part of the story. I skipped that. Um, <clears throat> uh, one of the things that we learned with this little study up in, in uh, Hanover, um, uh, we, we proved that DDT was killing a lot of birds and so forth. We also discovered it didn't save the elm trees. And that struck me as ridiculous. I mean, here we're spraying it on the trees. The elms continue to die. It might help a little bit, but they, 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 and there's a whole story about how uh, the, the elm bark beetle infects the tree and so forth. Um, but DDT just doesn't save the elm trees. Um, so here was a ridiculous process being used by thousands of t towns all over the eastern United States um, that effectively killed millions of birds and didn't save the trees. I mean, how dumb can you get? Uh, uh, and that was one of the impulses that led us to go after DDT because this is a, a dumb story. Yeah, one of the new terrifying uh, chemicals out there, uh, although I don't, don't call it a chemical, it's the Zika virus and the, they're going after it with biological vectors, uh, mosquitoes that are uh, in you know, male mosquitoes intended to mate and they just don't have vi viable kids. Uh, any lessons learned that you can draw from your experience? Uh, I mean about biological vectors? Uh, yes, and, and there's a, a fair literature developing on that. I was even reading some of it in science quite recently. <clears throat> uh, the genetic approaches, raising mosquitoes with a, with a fatal gene. Uh, that, that uh, uh, and they breed with, they release all these mosquitoes and they breed with the wild mosquitoes and the offspring are dead. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the, the use of an insecticide to kill insects it, it ultimately kills itself uh, with resistance. The insects are just, they, they reproduce rapidly and it's simply evolution. They figure out ways to get around it. Uh, and so, and, and not, not only does it, does it breed resistance to that chemical, but there's cross resistance. Uh, so th they win the battle of the chemicals and c killing insects is not a, 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 a usually an effective way to control them. And that's why a lot of work is now going into uh, other, uh, other approaches like which you mentioned.